All right, it is uh, right about noon, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, my name is Brooke Quito. I'm a program coordinator with Alzheimer's Services. Thank you all, everybody, for joining us today for our first event of the ADAPT series of the year. We have some really exciting stuff coming up throughout the year, um, education presentation wise. So I hope you all continue to join us for all of our programs. Um, you can see any of our dates for our upcoming events on our website, alzbr.org, in the events calendar. Uh, for some housekeeping for today, today's presentation will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel after uh, the presentation today, and your calls will remain muted throughout the entire presentation. To ensure that we record your presentation, if you are needing a CEU certificate, please make sure that your display name is both your first and your last name so that we can accurately um, record presentation um, participation. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you're going to be muted, so go ahead and um, put your question into the chat box, and then at the end of the presentation, we're going to have some time for question and answer, and we'll answer any of those questions then. Uh, so today, we have a really interesting uh, topic of adaptive approaches to end-of-life care, and so I'm going to introduce our presenter, which is Ms. Robin Palmer Blanche. And after decades as a successful Hollywood writer and producer, Robin's experience with her father's death, as well as her own cancer diagnosis, prompted her to become an end-of-life doula and a grief educator in order to companion others through the process. In addition to completing numerous general trainings, she has also taken courses focusing specifically on dementia and pediatric death. She is a member of ENELDA, which is the International End-of-Life Doula Association, and NEDA, which is the National End-of-Life Doula Alliance, as well as a certified grief educator through the world-renowned grief expert, David Kessler. Ms. Robin also recently did a TEDx talk, which um, she spoke about preparing for your death now, and allowing, um, by preparing for your death now, it allows you to be more present with your loved ones in the end. Because of Miss Robin's 30-year writing background and as a 12-time published novelist and produced screenwriter, she also writes legacy memoirs for individuals um, and families and organizations. She resides in Baton Rouge with her husband and two children and also works remotely with people all across the country. So I am so happy that we have um, Miss Robin here today to talk to us about a topic um, that a lot of us don't hear much education about. Um, so, so happy that we're able to provide this for um, all of our audience today. So Miss Robin, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Um, I, I love to talk about end of life and hopefully make it a little easier for other people to do so. Um, and what I wanna start with is a short guided meditation. So wherever you are, if you could just get comfortable, get grounded, if you're comfortable closing your eyes, do so. If not, just soften your gaze and just sort of feel your back against the back of the chair, your feet on the ground, and just start to take a few slow, deep breaths. So inhale, and then exhale. One more time, inhale, and then exhale. And now keeping your eyes softened, I'm going to invite you to imagine yourself sitting in a doctor's office. You haven't been feeling well, and recently you went in to get a bunch of tests gone done, and now you're sitting down to hear the results from the doctor. And the doctor comes in and tells you that they're sorry to have to tell you this, but you're dying. You have 
only a few months left. And treatment might help, but probably not at this point. And I'm going to invite you to just sort of really stay in your body and feel where this news hits you. Is it a tightening in your chest? Is it a clenching in your stomach? Is it your throat closing up? And what thoughts and feelings go through your head as you hear this? So again, I'm going to say this, the doctor's telling you, you are dying. How does that land? Are you afraid? Are you sad? Are you feeling so many emotions that you just shut down and go numb? And now I want you to think about leaving the doctor's office and going somewhere to sit by yourself to allow the news that you only have a few months left to settle in. And what is it that do you, that you do? Do you pick up the phone immediately and call your loved ones? Are you ready to share it? Or is it something that you need to wrap your head around first for a while? And whatever your response is to the news, there's no right or wrong but explore what's behind that. Is your initial response not to tell people because you wanna protect them? And if so, why? Every thought and feeling that you have during this meditation is valid. So don't judge it, just sort of be curious about it. And now it's three months later. By this time, everyone knows that you're dying and you've definitely been declining. It's much harder for you to take care of yourself. You're less stable when you walk from room to room and you're starting to be less involved with the outside world and even with the people that you love. And now I'm gonna ask you, at this point, is the thought of death less frightening to you or is it more frightening? And if it's the latter, what is it that you're afraid of? Is it not knowing what dying is gonna feel like? Is it the fear and unknown of what happens to you after you die? Is it not wanting to leave the world behind and the people that you love? Is it worry about your family when you're gone and how they'll on? Or are you relieved? Have you been fighting for so long? Have you gotten to a place with your family and your relationships where you feel the sense of completion and you're able to let go? And now you're on your deathbed and death is imminent. And think about where you are. Do you think you're going to be at home? Are you in a hospital? By this point, your eyes are closed and you can't move any of your body. You're unresponsive to the outside world, but you can still hear and you're still aware of everything around you. And I'm gonna ask you to think of how does that space look? What are the smells? What are the sounds? Is there music? Who's there with you? Is your family there? Are your pets there? And now I'm going to ask you to move from the outside and go inside. What do you think those thoughts and feelings are? Are you still afraid? Or at this point, is there more of a curiosity and a longing to start this next leg of your journey? Is there a sense of profound love and being welcomed? Do you have any regrets? Just sort of sit with that. And now we're gonna come back to the room. So I'm gonna ask you to be conscious of your breath again. 
start to be conscious of your feet on the floor, your back against the chair, wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes, feel the rise and the fall of your belly as you breathe. And then when you're ready, I invite you to open your eyes and just sort of look around, focus on what you see, what you hear. Okay, so congratulations on spending more time contemplating death than most people will do this week. Um, death is something that we are, it, it's ironic because it's the only thing we're guaranteed of, and yet it's the thing that we least like to talk about it. Um, I love to talk about it, which is why I became an end-of-life doula. And today we're going to talk about not just what an end-of-life doula does and the way that they can be of service to people, but also the adaptations for end-of-life care when it comes to dealing with people with dementia. So just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, Brooke read you my bio. Um, but the reason that I came to this was my own personal experience. My father was diagnosed with stage four cancer in 2019. He lived in Arizona and I was his advocate. Um, luckily, my father and I, had, we had a wonderful relationship and we were able to spend the last five year, five months of his life really coming to completion with our relationship. And when he died, there was nothing left unsaid. My sister and I were with him holding his hands and it was a really, really beautiful passing. But on the flip side of that, my dad was completely unprepared on a practical level. So in between sitting with my dad in the hospital, my sister and I had to sell his house. We had to move him into assisted living. We had to rehome his two elderly dogs. We had to hunt down his passwords, his safe deposit box. And, you know, it all got done. But the price we paid for that was, you know, all of those stories that I had heard a million times before and wished I could have taped or written down for my own children who are were four and five at the time i didn't get a chance to do that so after his death it showed me sort of this real need to be prepared when the end comes because the more that we can prepare for the end beforehand the more present we're able to be with our families at the end the name of my company is called You Were Here because I found it really fascinating that studies have showed that the number one fear about dying is not whether it will hurt or what will happen afterwards, but the fear of being forgotten. So I've sort of dedicated my life to making sure not only that people are not forgotten um, at the end when they're gone, but also that the very end of their life they're surrounded by the things that matter and they've made the decisions beforehand when they're still in a state of mind where they're able to do that so that they have the kind of death that they want. I was trained by Anelda um, and I'm also a member of NIDA, which is the National End of Life Doula Alliance. Um, and I've done trainings in uh, pediatric death through the Conscious Dying Institute and dementia through ANELDA. Um, in addition to being a grief educator, I'm also a certified grief, grief movement facilitator, which is essentially using movement, breath, and sound to process grief, um, which has been really, really helpful for me to be awful, able to offer the families that I work with. And finally, I am a legacy memoirist, which I just love. So what is an end-of-life doula? Doula is a Greek word that means woman who serves. And doulas have been around for centuries because back when we used to die at home rather than hospitals, we all knew how to help someone die. Um, 
the numbers of end of life doulas are growing. So to give you some context, in 2019, the National End of Life Doula Alliance had only 200 members. And now in 2024, there's 1,500, which is good because the population of people over the age of 80 worldwide is going to triple by 2050. So you have a lot of aging people. And doulas provide resources and support on a practical, emotional, and spiritual level to people at the end of life. And they also provide that to the families. And we're going to get into a lot about, especially when you're dealing with dementia, why, you know, that aid for caregivers is so important. Doulas do not provide medical, legal, or financial device advice, and they do not slow or hasten the dying process. Essentially, when people ask me what I do, I say, I listen, and then I go from there. What I do is I hold space as people process and come to their own decisions. I can supply information, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm helping you to be your own best advocate through education. There's a lot of benefits um, to having a doula involved with people. So I'm going to start by saying doulas are not um, covered by insurance at this moment, which is too bad. Now in Louisiana, um, birth doulas are going to be covered in certain um, uh, it, ways, which is going to be great. Um, but in my TED talk, I talked about the fact that we're powerless over the fact that we're going to die, but we can be intentional about how we want the end of our life to go. So by hiring a doula to work with someone who is dying as well as their families, there is often a decrease in fear. There's education about options. There's a greater satisfaction with care. There's better attention paid to the dying person's wishes. There's a reduction of burden on the loved ones. There's an increased support for family. There's earlier emotional support, which often helps with the anticipatory grief that comes up. And there's a better continuity of care. And so the specific ways that I often help people is I, everywhere from the practical to the emotional. So a lot of times uh, doulas can help you with your advanced directive planning. Um, some of you may be familiar with Five Wishes or the Conversation Project, which are two great organizations which not only help you fill out your advanced directives, but also talk about the kind of care you want at the end of life. And the Conversation Project, especially, I love it. They have some workbooks that you can download online. It talks about having these conversations. Um, you know, a doula will uh, provide emotional support and respite for a family. Um, I often tell people that, you know, once someone is diagnosed with a life limiting disease, we go into a lot of fear. And a lot of those family dynamics are activated. Um, so you might be, you know, 50 years old, living across the country, been in therapy your whole life, but you know, you go home because your mom's dying. And suddenly you're, you know, that 15 year old scared middle child again. So a doula, as someone who is not part of the family, can sort of sit there and hold space um, as an impartial observer so that they help family members work through a lot of that fear and anger so that they can then show up and be their best selves within that family. Doulas also can help people find completion with their relationships. In my TED talk, I talked about Dr. Ira Bayak, who's a palliative care physician. Um, and he talks about these four phrases 
that people at the end of life can start to consider that can really help them bring completion to their relationships. And those phrases are, please forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, and I love you. And the sooner people can start doing that work, it's not only helpful to them, but also to their loved ones. So everyone feels at peace by the time that person takes their final breath. Doulas can also help with legacy projects. That's everything from writing down personal histories to doing scrapbooks. Um, I recently did a project with a woman who was dying, who was an amazing cook. And we took all of her recipes and I said, okay, tell me the story behind this cake. And she said, oh, that was the cake that, you know, my great grandmother um, made it for people's birthdays. So that is the birthday cake in our family. So we wrote the story behind it and we included pictures of, you know, people blowing out the candles on the cake. And we made this amazing cookbook. Um, and it's such a wonderful example of who she was as, you know, her love language was food. So everyone in her family now has a copy of this and this keeps her alive, even though she's gone. Uh, a doula can also provide education about the dying process. You know, so what are the different stages of dying? What happens in the, you know, last three months versus when someone goes into active dying? Because a lot of times we get so afraid of what, you know, when, whether it's um, how our breathing changes or whether our extremities start, the color starts to change as our, um, you know, our body starts to shut down. A doula also helps with vigil planning, and that is everything that you want at the very, very last days and hours. So that's everything from, do you want music there? Is there a certain room in your house with a view that you'd love to be at, you know, at the very end? Is there certain smells you want there? Um, a doula can help you write your obituary. Um, a doula can help talk about, you know, help you plan for the funeral and decide about the disposition of your body. So do you want to be cremated or do you want to be buried? Um, I dealt with a family once where the mother had never said what she wanted. Her Basically, when she got to the end of life, she said, oh, I'm not going to be here, so it doesn't matter to me. You figure it out. So it was time, you know, to decide what was going to happen. And one of her children said, well, mom wanted to be cremated. And the other one said, no, she didn't. She wants to be buried. And that's not something that you get a do over. So that's why having these conversations up front are so important. Um, what I tell people that, you know, by bringing the doula into this situation, it's really the biggest gift you can give your family because it's taking the onus off of them to make a lot of these decisions because sometimes these decisions are made and then there's so much guilt after it. Um, I was recently interviewed by this reporter for a news program, and she told me about how when her mom was dying, um, she had to go to Dillard's and pick out a dress for her mom to wear for the funeral. And she said, you know, it's been two years. And she said, sometimes I'll just think, did I make the right decision? Like, would my mom have been happy with the decision I made? And, you know, it seems like not a big deal, but it's a huge deal to the people who are left behind. And also a doula can help you with, you know, starting to process your grief before the person even dies. A lot of times when we're left with, you know, doing all of this busy work with getting together our passwords or finding, you know, mom's files or where's her birth certificate, whatever. Um, we don't have the room to feel our feelings. We just have to keep going. So what happens is after someone dies, it's kind of like wily e. coyote on the edge of the 
cliff. You know, you've been going a million miles an hour and then you just crash. So hopefully this allows you to just sort of, um, you know, feel and do. So when the end comes, the grief that you're left with, it's more because you miss the person and it's less about regret. So I don't know, some of you might be familiar with the book Being Mortal by Atul Gawande, who is an amazing physician who wrote a memoir um, when his father was diagnosed with um, cancer and he found himself on the other side of the desk, as it were. Um, he started the conversation project, which I alluded to earlier, in order to help everyone talk about their wishes for care through the end of life so those wishes can be understood and respected. So five questions that he asks his patients with a serious illness are, what is your understanding of where you are and of your illness? What are your fears and worries for the future? What are your goals and priorities? What outcomes are unacceptable to you? And what are you willing to sacrifice and not sacrifice? And what would a good day look like for you? And I love to talk to people about these questions because that really helps them to sort of hone in on what's important for those last few months. So again, what you're hoping for is that when you die, you know, the regrets you have are minimal. So the very first question that I ask someone when I, when I first meet with them is what feels undone right now in your life? And for some of those people, it's, I need to get my, you know, advanced directive done, or I need to start an end of life file that has all my important documents. And for other people, it's, you know, I haven't talked to my sister in 15 years. And I hate the idea of dying without that relationship, you know, having some reconciliation there. So, you know, we're all going to die and um, death is, uh, it's not easy ever, but when you're working with someone who has dementia, um, it's a much different situation. So what I tell people is when you can bring a doula in, in the early stages after a diagnosis, it's so helpful because when that person is still in a situation where they can communicate their wishes and you're hearing it from there, there's a real sense of empowerment. Um, there's 7 million dementia patients in the U.S., and 80% of them are being cared for at home by their family. And this kind of care requires twice as much time than any other patient. And the thing about dementia patients are when you get to the very, very end of life, um, dementia doesn't play by the end-of-life rules that other diseases do. So... You know, for someone with dementia, they might be withdrawn from the world or, you know, talking to people who we don't see in the room or sleeping for hours at end for years before the end of life. But for a lot of other diseases, like that's how you really know that you're getting to the end. Um, but late stage dementia can last a couple of years. Hospice is designed to be used when the patient is expected to live for six months or less. But a lot of times with dementia patients, you don't know they're ready for hospice until they get to the point where they can no longer swallow. And when they can no longer swallow, that's when they're no longer taking in adequate nutrition and they're rapidly losing weight. So when we're dealing with people with dementia, what I have found is oftentimes I am the most service to the caregivers. Um, the toll on the caregivers for people when their loved one has dementia is overwhelming and it already has been for years. And 
you know, for many of them, they lost their loved ones years before, because with dementia, we're talking about sort of death by a hundred cuts. So by the time their person is finally dying, they often feel a sense of relief. And that sense of relief often brings a lot of guilt. So a lot of times the work that I do as a doula when working with the loved ones with dementia is really holding space for them to process the often complicated feelings that they have at that time. Um, caregivers, when you're dealing with someone with a life limiting illness, a lot of times at the very end, you can still have a relationship with that person. There's still a back and forth exchange and there's still a gratitude expressed between you. But the inability to communicate with a dementia, um, someone suffering from dementia, makes this difficult. So bringing in a doula is a prime example of where doula support is just as much for the family as it is for the per person dying. And a lot of times what I will say when I'm brought in to work with a family um, where the person dying has dementia is, okay, who is your village, right? Who can you lean on for help for the more practical needs at this time so that you can spend the time that's left just being with your loved one, sitting there and remembering the good times and processing your anticipatory grief. So how can you surround yourself so that you are held from the outside so that inner circle can be together? Because a lot of times you are the voice and the heart for this person who is, for all intents and purposes, not present anymore. So a lot of times what I'll do, it's I help people with what we call RUGS, and RUGS stands for Regrets, Unfinished Business, Guilt, and Shame. So when we're talking about dementia, a doula can work with family members to distinguish symptom-driven behavior from the conscious intentional hurt caused by dementia in the person dying. So by working on our rugs, it allows us the ability to heal wounds that was caused by dementia symptoms. You know, intellectually, we know that the person's behavior is because of the disease, but it's still, we have to do that work to be able to process it, you know, in our heart. So there's different ways that I do this with people. A lot of times, I will suggest to someone, you know, to write a letter, to get to a place where they write a letter to that person, you know, um, forgiving them um, for, for, you know, the, any resentment they might have and asking for forgiveness. Um, and then after they write the letter, I'm a big believer in ritual, which we're going to talk about a little later, but they can then burn this letter or bury this letter to represent letting go of the old pain caused by dementia or relegating it to the past. And I, speaking of letters, I wanna bring up something that I think is really interesting. Um, so that veil at the very, very end of life is very thin. And my experience with it has been that our energy, you know, we pick up on everyone's energy during that time. So I was working with a woman whose father was on hospice and um, it was taking a long time for him to die. And she, we were talking and she said, you know, I just want him to die already. And I feel so guilty about that. And I said, well, have you told him that he can go? And she said, oh, no, I, I feel awful. He's my dad. I don't want him to think that, you know, I want him to leave. And I said, well, you know, he, even though he's unresponsive, he can still hear you. So if you're not willing to say that, would you be willing to write him a letter telling him that he can go? And she said, I'd be willing to do that. So she wrote him this letter and then she decided to dissolve it in some water. And she did that. And the next day she went to the hospital 
and four hours later he died and it was just this and i've seen that's not the first time i've seen that happen so i really do believe my experience has been that a lot of times people are not going to let go until they feel that they can leave and you're okay with that so i tell people you know even if they can't hear you still tell them make sure they know um, another way to deal with rugs um, a lot of times i'll work with people through guided imagery and we'll sort of work through kind of letting go of of those feelings and also finally we do something called mapping emotions so feelings are easier to label whereas emotions can take over and we all know that phrase a flood of emotions so a lot of times what we can do is i'll say okay let's say we're dealing with the feeling of shame so i'll have people sort of draw what shame looks like and how it feels as it moves through the body so a lot of times it's it's getting from just talking about it and getting out of your head with dealing with a feeling and really moving it through your body another thing that i do with families um, whose loved one has a uh, dementia is if the person dying is not in a position to do a life review. We do it as a group. Um, so this can be really, really healing as it allows people to collectively remember who the person was before the disease sets in. So in a life review, we'll talk about what accomplishments the person has been most proud of. What are the person's favorite and most formative stories? What life lessons have been prominent for the person? How has their spirituality shaped their life? What are their most strongly held values or beliefs? What character traits define them? What important roles has the person played during their lifetime? And do any life themes stand out? And doing this as a group, um, it's really healing because it allows us to, there's something, and, and we don't do this as a group, like we live in a society, you know, the paradox is we're so connected by technology, but we're so rarely together to grieve collectively. Um, and being able to sort of process someone's life through them who's unable to communicate that any longer can be very, very healing. And we can also bring out artifacts that reflect the meaning. So if you're talking about maybe someone um, was a veteran, right, and bringing out their medals or whatever and talking about how that was such an important part of their life. And that brings me to legacy. So we've talked about legacy projects, different ones that can be done. Um, when you're dealing with someone with dementia, it's hard because again, this is often something that you have to do with family members. Um, one of the things you can do is you can do a memory box. So bringing out their most cherished items and depending on where they are in their dementia journey, um, maybe it's some pictures. And you could say, do you want to put this picture in there or that one? And it allows them to stay involved, but you're not sort of stressing them out by putting forth an open-ended question that they're going to struggle with answering. Um, video or audio archives, albums or scrapbooks. Um, some people like to make quilts over, you know, using sort of old shirts or t-shirts or ties or whatever, um, making a collage, crafting an object, collections. We talked about recipes, um, maybe a collection of their famous sayings, their, their favorite sayings, their favorite scriptures, any poems, doing a family tree. Um, voicemails, you know, a beautiful thing to do is having the people leave voicemails for the people they love and saying this is everything i love about you so not only do they have sort of this you know thing that's going to live forever but they also get to hear their loved one's voice which is really beautiful um scientific 
American has said that it was found that people who wrote about engaging in a ritual reported le feeling less grief than those who did so only writing about the loss. So ritual is something that can be used at different times during uh, someone's end of life journey. So maybe someone's been undergoing treatment and they decide the time has come to stop. So really kind of memorializing that decision and doing some sort of ritual then can be really beautiful and, and be helpful to sort of going into this, this new chapter. Um, when someone enters into hospice, when active dying begins, after the last breath, when the body is removed. And, you know, there's different things you can do with that ritual. Um, music, candles, essential oils, flowers, photos, favorite scripture and poems. Um, when I was putting together my vigil plan, I had to do it for one of my doula trainings and I got really into it. And I did a whole playlist for my vigil. Um, I, you know, I, my husband walked by as I was doing this. I talked about this in my TED talk. And I said, you know, I'm writing everything that I want at the very, very end. And he said, you know, that's a very detailed list. And I said, this is going to be my last time to micromanage. So I'm going to, you know, do it as much as I can. Um, it might sound silly, but it's little things like on my vigil plan, I wrote, I don't want any socks on my feet. I'm someone who hates socks in bed, right? Um, I love blankets, right? I don't want to just be covered with a sheet, even if I'm hot. So these are all things that at the very, very end, I'm not going to be able to communicate them. So I need to make sure that I can do that before I go. So in your vigil list, music, smells, the view, blankets, photographs, maybe you want to say, you know, when I'm dying, I don't want the sound of any TV. I don't want the discussion about any money. I just want people to sit around and recount their favorite memories with me. One of the things that I have in my vigil plan is that when people come to say goodbye, I want a box of note cards near the door. And I want them to take the time to write down what it is they learned from the way that I live my life. And I want that typed up and given to my children. And that's not something that if I wasn't prepared to die and I wasn't accepting that I was dying and I wasn't doing the work to, you know, have this all communicated beforehand, I wouldn't think about that stuff because I'd be too panicked trying to get everything together. But because I do spend my time thinking about this, I have the time and the space to think about what is meaningful to me and that will be meaningful to my family. Emerson Lee is a dementia readiness coach out of the Pacific Northwest. Um, her website is called makinghappymemories.com. And she's amazing. Her website has a lot of resources for um, helping people with dementia. And she talks about something called micro delights. And she came up with this, you know, she said, when you move someone into a memory care facility, um, they're not going to be able to communicate a lot of the times. But being able to supply the caretakers there with a list of the things that bring them joy is so helpful. So for instance, you know, how do they like their coffee? Do they even like coffee or do they like tea? What's their favorite music? So let's say, you know, you're talking about your dad who has dementia every day at three o'clock. He loves to have a cup of chamomile tea and listen to Duke Ellington, right? If we know these things, even though the person is not going to be able to communicate necessarily what that means to them, it's going to give them a sense of comfort. So if we start compiling this early on, we can use it all the way up to the end. So these are just, you know, um, what a doula is there to do is to 
bring up things that you wouldn't necessarily think of, right? So for instance, I was recently talking to a woman. Um, she's not married. She doesn't have kids. Uh, but she has this dog who's the love of her life. And I said, what's going to happen to your dog when you die? And she said, oh, well, my mom's going to take him. And I said, how old's your mom? And she said, 80. And I said, you know what? You might want to rethink that. Like you might want to come up with a plan. So these are things, you know, even when I'm helping someone do their advanced directive, um, you know, do you want antibiotics if you have an infection? Because if you have antibiotics, it's going to extend your life. Do you want artificial hydration? This is all stuff. Um, I was dealing with a family um, and the nurse asked, you know, do you want to give her artificial hydration? And one of the kids said, absolutely. And the other one said, no. And this became a real point of contention. So the sooner we can talk about this and, you know, get it down on paper, there's not going to be any questions later on. So that is what I have to share with you today. Um, as I said, there's so much to talk about. Um, this is just a beginning, but you know, luckily I feel like we live in a time and a place where, especially post COVID, where we saw so much death, we're talking about death a lot more. There's a ton of books out there. There's a ton of podcasts. Um, there's a ton of programming. And, you know, my hope is that we get the conversation going so that we can, you know, the more we talk about it, I love to work with people who are younger and healthy because they get prepared now and then they talk to their aging parents and they say, hey, I'm doing this work now. And it, it takes away the sting and it allows them to be less afraid to do that. So I'm happy to take any questions that we have and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can thank see. You. Thank you so much, Miss Robin. That was absolutely fascinating. I think brings up a lot of, um, a lot of things that, uh, I'm going to be thinking about, um, throughout the day too. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so we have some time for some questions to come into the chat box. So please um, submit those as you have them. Um, I have a few questions that I wanted to ask first while we wait for some other ones to come in. Um, Miss Robin, what do you wish that every family or family unit or village, what do you wish they knew about end of life care? Um, I wish they knew that talking about death is not going to make it come faster. You know, I think a lot of people put off these conversations because they're afraid, you know, they're afraid of the grief that's going to come up. They're afraid to, you know, even accept the fact that they're going to die. And the truth is, I always say to people, the more I talk about death, the more present for my life I am. You know, and it makes me look at things through this lens of, I know my time here is limited. So what is important to me to do now? So it's really freeing once you start to talk about this. And for someone like me, you know, I, I tell people about the importance of doing their advanced directives and making sure it's uploaded on my chart and stuff. But I'll tell you when it was time for me to do my advanced directive, the amount of anxiety that came up as I really seriously contemplated these questions, knowing that they could be a reality one day, that they they will be a reality, but then the freedom that I felt once it was done and how happy I was that I had done that for my family so they don't have to guess. That, your quote that you said just now, talking about death doesn't make it come faster. That is great. Had to write it down. It was very good. Um, okay. Another question that I have for you. Um, what do you wish that dementia healthcare professionals or just healthcare professionals in general, what do you wish that healthcare professionals knew about the end of life process? You know, 
I think that um, uh, so many doctors, um, they're taught how to heal and how to cure, but they're not taught how to help someone die, right? So, you know, even I think about my dad and he did chemo and he did four rounds of chemo and then he just could not bounce back and everything started to shut down. And finally he was in the hospital and we were gonna move him to hospice. And I said to his oncologist, we're moving him to hospice. And she said, why? His PET scan showed no evidence of disease. And I said, he's clearly dying. You know, he's got a failure to thrive is written on his chart. And, you know, she didn't know what to say to me. You know, and I think that a lot of times, um, again, there's, a, I think healthcare professionals feel that they failed at their job if they weren't able to save someone. So they don't want to talk about that. And they sort of wash their hands. And then we as people feel like, you know, left twisting in the wind because there's no one to talk us through this. My oncologist, when I told him I became a doula, he was so happy. He said, you know, when I get to the point where I know I can't help anyone anymore, I talk about like, what can we do to make sure your last few months are comfortable and happy and meaningful? You know, we don't have to, I think that's the thing. It's like, where is the meaning in this? And I think a lot more doctors are, because of their own brushes with mortality, finally start to see like, oh, wow, I've been, I'm not focusing on what's really important here. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's really, really good. Um, okay. And um, we got a, I have a few more questions. We, we still have about um, a few more minutes if anybody else has some more questions. Um, okay, one question is, what do you think about QR codes on gravestones? That is so <laughs> 2024. Um, and what do you think about it? And could that give some elements, um, some of the elements that you mentioned about legacy um, to be direct to on a gravestone? That's that is very 2024. <laughs> it, it is very 2024. Um, I think it's interesting. I think that, you know, the fact that um, what's going on and what's available to, like you can go on your phone. There's so many apps right now that allow you to sort of start leaving your legacy that way and stuff. Um I think it's, I think for, for people, for who that's important, you know, what, what I tell people is, you know, this is just like, we are all different individuals. Um, and what's important to us is, is going to differ. It's like, where is that going to give you solace? Is that going to give your family solace? Is that going to make you feel better Then go for it? You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, someone like me, like, so I'm going to choose, I don't want to be buried. So that's not something that would, I would ever contemplate because I don't want to be buried, you know, but for someone who is like, and that's great. Some people might say, oh, that's so, you know, uh, it, there's something so wrong with that. But again, it's just, so as a doula, my job is to like hold that space and listen and to help you get to a place of, like, oh, that's interesting. Why is that important to you? What do you feel like you're going to get from that? Mm hmm and that, that brings up something interesting, how death is so personal to each person mm -hmm. and just as personal for someone who is, um, healthy and thinking about it in, you know, a future type of way, but for someone who has dementia and who is, you know, being cared for by their caregiver, you know, it's still very personal to yes. that person. And, um, it, should in turn look different for everybody. Um, we just got someone in the chat saying how um, they have a loved one who um, lives out of state and they used a, a doula for their family during that dying process. And they had never heard of that before um, and are interested now that they know that there's one in Baton Rouge um, mm -hmm. uh, for the person that wrote this. I also um, 
had no idea that there was someone local. And I went to the Inelda website for looking for someone to do this presentation. And I found Robin and I called her and I was, it's just, it was meant to be um, for us to have um, someone local that we can, um, you know, that this movement is, you know, starting to, you know, creep down to Louisiana. Um, so a question that I have going back to, um, you know, how, death is very personal and like preparing for the end of life process is very personal. Um, I was speaking to someone yesterday about environment and how much environment impacts somebody with dementia and how they orient themselves. Can you talk a little bit about how like a physical environment can add to the end of life process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I had this amazing um, experience recently where I, as I mentioned, I do these legacy memoirs and I had been hired by um, a family to do this woman's legacy memoir. And two weeks after we finished, she was diagnosed with glioblastoma and she was 83. And within two months she had died. Um, but because, I knew her so well from having written her memoir. Um, I, she, she was, um, her faith was incredibly important to her and she had put together a book of scripture for her church at one point. And I knew this. So once I would go over to visit her and I would read to her from the scripture and I got the phone call from her son that hospice said she had 12 to 24 hours um, until she went. So I went over there and I got the book of uh, scripture and I put on her favorite music, which I knew from, you know, having done the memoir. And I started reading uh, the scripture and I read her favorite piece and she took her last breath right then. Like it was amazing. And so I think about this notion of, you know, making sure even again, um, if we're not, if we're not an ability in, in a place to be able to communicate, like making sure that our, not just for the person dying, but for the family, that what is around is the stuff that has brought us joy, right? The smells from the kitchen or the certain kind of flowers or the blankets or whatever, but we can relax into that and it helps like what the more that we can do to relax, the easier it's kind of like birth, right? So we all know about birth doulas, right? The more that we can feel comfortable, our body can literally relax to bring, you know, this new life into the world. It's the same with leaving, like the transition is just going to be easier if we're able to set up an environment that's more welcoming. Great, great. Thank you. Um, okay, my last question uh, before we end today, unless anybody else has any questions, is you mentioned a lot today, which of course, within the end of life, we talk a lot about hospice. I think usually that is about where the conversation ends for most families and medical professionals is, okay, it is end of life. Now we're just going to talk about hospice. Obviously, now we know that there is so much more possibility. There is so, you know, there are other support options out there in conjunction with hospice but can you talk a little bit about how either using a doula or even just us as family caregivers how we can work alongside hospice to better the effort and make someone more comfortable in the end of life process mm -hmm. yeah so what's really sad about hospice is you know you can go on hospice usually if it's been determined that you have six months left and I have to look for where I was listening to a podcast recently. I think it's like the average stay on hospice right now is 10 days. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people, because again, people think hospice, they think once you go on hospice, it's going to kill you. And the truth is actually a lot of people go on hospice and they, they live a lot longer because again, they're finally given the support that has not been available to them. 
Um, and, and that's another thing that I tell people too, like you have a choice of hospices too, because a lot of people will say to me, my experience with hospice was horrible. And it's like, okay, that was one hospice. Like there's other ones, like take the time to, to talk to these people and ask your questions, you know, um, having a doula of uh, what it allows you to do too because this is a you know when someone's dying or has received a, a diagnosis we go into crisis mode and a lot of times you know we're reactive rather than proactive right so this notion of really being able to establish relationships especially with people on hospice um, are great. And, you know, the thing about hospice, like they're not living in your house 24 seven, like that does not happen. And I think some people think that is what it is. So it's really about educating yourself. And again, I think that's where, um, sadly with hospitals too, like when you have such a full caseload, they don't have the time to sort of walk you through, this is what you can expect from hospice. And these are the questions you should ask, whatever. And that is where a doula comes in handy too, to be able to be another form of support, an added layer, you know, along with the social work, a lot of, you know, a, a lot of end of life doulas um, in had been nurses before or had been social workers. And this is sort of something that they add to the repertoire, but um, being able in, um, I think it was in Canada, I was reading a study, um, they were saying that to be able to add a doula to an oncology department would be so helpful you know, because it's like, they just don't have the time to provide that one-on-one -on -one, um, help to not just the person who's dying, but to the family. And I tell people, you know, when I come in, uh, sometimes I'm hired by the person who's dying. Sometimes I'm hired by the family members and I never even talk to the person who's dying, you know? So it's really, it's, it's sort of whoever needs the most support at that time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for um, sharing, you know, all of your wisdom today and your expertise on, on this topic. And, um, what I'm going to do for everybody, um, I'm, that has attended today, I'm going to send a follow-up email that will include all of, a lot of the links that, um, were discussed today. And then we'll also have an evaluation attached if you'll go ahead and fill that out. Um, for anybody that is a social worker needing a CEU, you have to fill out the evaluation and that's how I will um, produce your certificate. Um, I will also have, I know I have a couple of questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, I'm gonna have Ms. Robin's contact information in the follow-up email as well, her email. Um, and I'll also link to her website so that you can, um, find where to find her. And then of course, for any questions about, as always, any questions about dementia care, if you have questions about what hospices are available locally, um, questions about dementia support in general, that's exactly what we're here for. We are so happy to help you at Alzheimer's Services. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end the chat again. Thank you so much, Ms. Robin. Um, and thank y'all, everybody that has attended today. Take care. Bye-bye.